voice this to you, Lord. I pray, God, that you touch every heart, that your presence be known. That, Lord, that you just fill this room with your Holy Spirit, God. Yes! Heavenly Father, remind us of the love that you have for us. Remind us of the love that you sent your Son, Jesus, to die on the cross. That you put your love on the line for us, God. So, Heavenly Father, as we lift our voices, as we lift our hands,
not about the clashing of symbols, it's not about like, the pressing of keys, it's not about the, the blowing of trumpets, it's not about all the noise, Father God, it's all about you, Lord. Yes. Lord, because without these lyrics, without all these words that we're singing right now, they have no meaning without you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We can, we can Jesus. say all these words, Father God, but if yes. we don't have you in our hearts, if we don't have this meaning of you behind it, Father God, yes. Lord, it has no meaning, Father. And it is your name, Jesus. It is your name that we adore, Father. Yes, Lord. It is your name, Father, that we love, Father God. So I just pray, Father God, that you just be adorned right now. Oh, gosh, I can't wait for Christmas. All this Christmas music, Lord. Talking about your birth, Lord.
Hallelujah, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Aren't we glad we're in the house of prayer tonight? Amen. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. At this time, we're going to pick up the offering. Praise God. If you guys need an envelope, raise your hand, and we have someone who's going to bring it out to you. Uh, if you're writing a check, make it out to Joyful Community Church. Amen. We're going to provide. We have to pay for things around here and to provide for our bishop. Amen. So give with the heart. If you can, if you can. Praise God. God will still bless you. Praise God. Amen. I'd like to share a little word that I share every night, just a, a short scripture, just for some encouragement. We just thank God that he has given the greatest gift, and that is Son, Jesus Christ, for us. Amen. Amen. And let's go to, I'm just going to read a little something from John chapter 14. And Jesus' great love for the church in chapter 14. Verse 15 to 16, if you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandment. And it's so important for us. And he said, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Praise God. Amen. This is a great gift that God has given us. Even when Jesus went back home to his father, he didn't leave us with, without anything. He gave us the comfort, which is the Holy Spirit, to teach us and to guide us. Amen. So now the Spirit of God lives in us. Praise God. Praise if God. lives Praise in God. us, then we can do the work upon earth. Amen. 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 And he will teach us and lead us into all truth. So yes. this is the greatest thing that, that we have, the great gift Amen. from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So at this time, we're going to pray for the offering. Amen. Amen. And after I'm done praying for the offering, I'm going to call up uh, Pastor Jay. We'll introduce our, our brother, Bishop Welch. Amen. And I'd like to thank all the pastors for coming out. And uh, I thank you to see uh, my, my pastor, uh, Harold Kilborn, that I served under him for about maybe six, seven years could be. And I just thank God, you know, we had great teachers. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Harold. And uh, our great sister Christy, amen. Love you folks. Amen. I just thank you all for being here. So let's bow in this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for being here. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for your presence, Father. We thank yes. you for your spirit, Lord. But I ask you, Lord, to bless to bless the offering, Father, to bless the hands, Father, that you provide for everyone, Lord, how you always do, Father. You have given us everything, Lord. Nothing more we need, Father. For we don't need to worry about anything when we're serving you, Lord. For you provide for us, Lord. And you guide us, Lord, in everything. So we put our trust in you, dear Lord. And we just thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, somebody. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I need to pump you up, man. Eh? No need to pump already, right? Oh, yeah. The Holy Spirit will pump you up already, right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, this guy, this man of God, is coming to us from all the way, all over. He traveled all over. He said, if you ask me to come, I will come. And he's been living up to that word ever since. Amen. Amen. I don't know what you guys came here to do, but I know what the Holy Spirit came here to do, yes. to impart. Now, you cannot impart if the heart is not open and willing to receive, yeah? Yes. Yeah, hallelujah. Some of us get seeds already been planted and needed to be watered tonight, yes. yeah? Oh, the Holy Spirit is moving, moving. Hallelujah. 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 So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome for our Bishop Fred Welch.
You didn't ever hear that, huh? He bought, he bought me some funny popo. <laughs> Hallelujah. So glad to be here tonight. Thank God for his presence in this place. Just want to say thank you to the worship team. Amen. Let's give them a hand. Thank you, Jesus. It's a blessing to see young people serve the Lord with their hearts, their giftings, their talents. And that's what makes a church a church. Also wanted to give honor to, of course, our mama. <laughs> Pastor Kathy. Everybody, let's give her a hand. I really appreciate her for just bringing us all together into the different pastors, Pastor Tammy, Pastor Carl. I love Pastor, uh, Pastor Carl. I remember when I first gave my life to the Lord, and that was the last time I gave my life to the Lord, but the first time I gave my life to the Lord, <laughs> I, I remember coming to Kauai with my auntie then. We had a group called Willie, and he, he preached a message, and it was called, I, I believe your church was inside you guys' garage or something? Yeah. And I remember this message even to today. I even preached it once or twice. Maybe not as good. But his, his message was, was entitled, uh, Worship Can Be Hazardous to Your Health. <laughs> and he was talking about uh, Nadab and Abihu when, when they uh, brought their false worship, I guess, and how God... Uh, Anyways, but, uh, <laughs> that, that really stuck with me. And, and I was saying, man, what, what, a, what a great perspective. What a great view of the Word of God. And it wasn't to bring fear, but it was to make us aware of the holiness of God. Yes. So I, I thank you guys so much for that, Pastor Tammy. You made your worship. Praise God. Hallelujah. Excited for tomorrow. Amen. And also to our host, um, Pastor William and Lady Annette, thank you so much. For hosting us, amen, feeding us. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, yeah, amen. We're so blessed. Pastor Harold, love you, my brother. Pastor Christy, thank you so much. Pastor Jay and everybody else, I just want to say that we just love you guys. We thank God for the privilege of coming here. Even to Ken Starr, I've never met him, but I've heard so much about him, and I'm so grateful that this place is available for the kingdom. Yes. And, and it's such a blessing and, um, you know, Ken, we just pray blessings over you, wherever you're at, you and your wife, your business, may you continue to prosper as, as you advance the kingdom according to God's word. Love you, Brother Ken. Thank you, Jesus. Can we uh, rise for the reading of the word? Tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 19, a familiar passage of scripture. really not here to preach anything new or to impress anybody um, but the Lord over the years put into my heart um, how many of you guys like Christmas? I love Christmas uh, the only thing I don't like about Christmas is um, when, when we gotta go set up the tree again <laughs> and we gotta for some, for some reason after we put away the tree get rid of the tree, we just roll up the lights any kind. Yeah. <laughs> we just roll them up into one ball and just throw this out of package. You know, we, we don't put it back the correct way. Well, most of us, that, well, at least I do. Uh, and what's hard about it is, is when it's time to set it up again, you're unraveling things. And it takes forever. Like, how did I get this into, how... You know, and then you have to go through it, go through it, and then you plug them in, and then what happens? No light. No light. The thing don't work. Now you got to go look at each and every single one. <laughs> it's very meticulous. But if we put it back, put things in a right way, yeah. when it's time to use it again, yeah. it'll shine. It'll work the way that it was intended to work. Yeah. But we need to put things into the right place. Yeah. And that's what it uh, is for me in the Word of God, that we have to put things in the correct place. Now, I'm not saying that I know it all. I don't. There's a lot more I need to learn, and I'm a lifelong learner, and I love to learn. I love to hear people preach and teach the Word of God. I'm so inspired by God's Word because it's true. Amen. It's true, and I love it. And guess what? God's Word works yes. for us. Oh, also, Mayor, thank you. God bless you, servant of God. Mayor, council member. Hallelujah. Thank God for him being here. And of course our pastors, thank you so much for bringing the worship. 
Anyways, let me just read the word. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 19. We want to make sure that you get the word of God for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. It says this, I'm reading for the New King James Version. It says, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, Jesus, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Amen. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we pray. Lord, that you speak to us tonight. Lord God, speak through me. And Lord, I know I'm not exempt for the words that you are saying tonight. So Lord, we pray that you just bless us from on high. Help us, oh God, to be aligned with your word, especially in this last hour. As we await Jesus' soon return. God, help us not to get ready, Lord, but to be ready. That we are your church, God, that you have brought us together for such a time as this. We love you, Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh God. In Jesus Christ's name and God's people say, amen. Amen. amen and amen. You may be seated. Last night we spoke uh, in the Old Testament, just setting it up for tonight. And my heart, as I prepared for this, the Lord put on my heart is the church, his bride. Yes. And, and how important it is, not for us to work, but for us to be prepared for the bridegroom. So the sermons that, that I've been preparing has to do more of a, uh, having a collective kind of sense, a collaborative kind of sense, and not so much as individuals. But though we as individuals, we do play a part. Last night we talked about when you're right can be wrong. There's a lot of things that we do that seems right, uh, but actually it's just good intentions, and it's not actually written in the Word of God. We say things, we do things that's totally out of whack, and then we wonder why God doesn't answer, and we wonder why we're not empowered to do the things that God has called us to do. And, and it's because when we think that we're doing right because we were taught that way or because we came to some kind of conclusion of what the Word of God says and God didn't really say it, and then we kind of get out of a line with what God is saying. And we get discouraged and we get disappointed. And sometimes we even teach that. We, we pass on this uh, false truth. And there's no power in false truth if it's not God's Word. If it's not God's word, it's our opinion. <laughs> it's our perspective. And that will count. <laughs> Especially in these last days. We want to make sure that we present the word of God so that people may be empowered, that people may be delivered, that people may be set free, amen, that people may be equipped yeah, for the advancement of his kingdom. The title of the message this uh, night is called The Church. The church, and again, I'm not gonna. I'm not here to present anything new. But my desire has always been to educate myself on uh, not just on church doctrine, but on the doctrine of the church. I love the church. I love God's church. I wish we could have church all the time, uh, but it's really not possible in today's world. But I can have my time with God whenever I want to. I don't have to go to a certain place, wait for a certain time, because the Spirit of God lives in me. The Spirit of God lives in you. I can enjoy God any time that I want to because He lives in me. And so when I talk about the church, I'm not also, I'm not talking about the statements of faith or my scriptural theoretical point of view, but from the observation of the function and operation of the church. So when I talk about the function and operation of the church, I'm not talking about administration, or I'm not talking about how we can get a building. I'm not talking about filling out paperwork. 
and all, all that other stuff. What I'm talking about the function of the church is what was God's intention? What was Jesus' intention when he mentioned the church to his disciples? And that's what I want to know because I want to make sure that what God has put into my hands, not just my church, but the churches that I oversee, I just want to make sure that we're doing God's will, God's way, according to God's word. Because we want to see God work in and through us. Because we want God to get the glory. Yes. That's the whole purpose. Even as a child, I'm sure a lot of us had a, a lot of toys. And there are some toys that I really love. And my parents also, you know, used to buy me toys that I liked. And I, I like like uh, transformers. I like uh, mechanical things. I like remote controls. But the thing about me is, I like to open them up. I wanted to see how they work. Though I didn't understand how, how they work, I just thought it was interesting. And I thought if I could just open it up and see inside, I'd go, oh, okay, that's how it works. Well, I open it up, it was more confusing. There's a lot of wires and microchips here and, and blinking lights there. I had no idea what those things were and the transmitters. And then when I tried to put it back together, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so, like, tonight, we're going to be just unraveling uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 30 to 19. Now we're going to put it back together the right way. Is that okay? Uh, I also wanted to introduce my beautiful wife, Pastor Zina. She's our co-pastor of Joyful Community Church, Maui. Can you stand, please? Amen. Amen. I'm a blessed man. Hallelujah. <laughs> There is a God. Amen. Yes, amen. For somebody like that to love me. God is good. Amen. God is good. I want to have Pastor Zina read for me verse 13 and 14. Pastor Zina, go ahead. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah but still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Amen. Holy Spirit, help me. Caesarea Philippi is a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, my wife and I have been there several times. Uh, I do tours there. I like to take the local people there to kind of see the land, and we do teachings at the different sites. And Caesarea Philippi is way up north, and it's at the base of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is a beautiful mountain filled with snow, and Mount Hermon uh, actually provides a lot of the water for Israel. And it flows down. And this water is like super clean, super pure. And at Caesarea Philippi, when we go there, uh, it's a place called uh, Banyas or Banya. And it was dedicated, that section was dedicated to the Greek god Pan, or Panya, which is a half goat, half man. You guys seen that, yeah. that thing? And, and it was a, a creature of mischief. But also in Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus was and his disciples, was a rock face. And along this wall, even to today, you can see all of the different temples that were once there. And so you can imagine Jesus and his disciples walking past this place and seeing all these temples that was dedicated to other gods. And at this place, they would make sacrifices. Um, sexual things were also ha happening. Uh, also, uh, the killing of, of children, of babies. That was part of the ritual. And though Jesus wasn't in the midst of those things, he was on the outskirts, and he was talking to his disciples what does he say? Who do men say that I am? Because he's in this place of false worship. And he wants to know, what are the people saying about me? And we're looking at this because Jesus is about to make his way back down to Jerusalem. Right after this. And he tells his disciples, he asks his, his disciples, who do men say that I am? Mm -hmm. 
And they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say some other prophet. Those were good. Those were awesome compliments that was coming from the people about Jesus. But guess what? They were complimentary wrong. <laughs> they really didn't know who Jesus was. But they said he had similarities. And we see the similarities with Jesus and John the Baptist. That John the Baptist was one who was in the wilderness who was crying out. Yeah. yeah? Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. John was baptizing for the, um, getting ready for the Messiah to come. And he was one who spoke out against King Herod. And he lost his life because of it. But he spoke out. And he was one of God's prophets. And Jesus said, this guy, I got to give him props. Yeah? I got to put it out there that John the Baptist is a okay guy. Of course, the Bible says it. I'm just um, kanaka phrasing it for you guys so we can move on <laughs> with the teaching. Then he also says, uh, some people say that you're like Elijah. Well, Elijah was one who battled the false prophets of Baal. And, and what happened? He won. And he stood against the king. And he stood against, again, False religion. Yeah. Then they also said, you remind us of Jeremiah. What was Jeremiah? Who was Jeremiah? Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. Yeah. Right? And he was being trained in the temple to one day maybe take his daddy's position as a Levite. And, and also, his ministry was for Judah. And crying out to Judah and telling Judah to turn from your wicked ways. Even if he knew that Judah wasn't going to turn, he still obeyed God. He still obeyed God's word. He was still faithful, even knowing that the people would turn, not just against God, but against him. Amen. Then they also said, oh, Jesus, you're maybe some other prophet. They were very wrong about who he is. And guess what? There's a lot of people nowadays who are saying the exact same thing of who Jesus is. They are very complimentary wrong. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Some say he's this, some say he's that. Some say, but nobody goes to the Bible and goes to the Word and point out who he is. But we as the church need to do that. We need to point out and we need to say who Jesus is. Amen. See, none of us, none of us like to be uh, told that we're somebody else. Have you guys ever had somebody come up to you and say, hey, aren't you so-and-so? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 that's not me. Are you sure? <laughs> um, I, I think so. <laughs> no, for real. Yeah. I told you no already. <laughs> you get on my last nerve. <laughs> And I remember during the pandemic and, uh, you know, we couldn't go into the stores uh, unless you was 55 or older. And I, I didn't know this. I didn't know this. The, the, the pandemic just started. And so I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm hungry for some corned beef, so I got to go, I gotta go store. So anyway, I ended up going to the store. I wanted to go early to miss the crowd. Lo and behold, all of Maui was at the store. So I had to stand in line. And as I stood in line, they looked at me, and, and they were letting in all the kupunas. Yeah. Oh, go inside, go inside. So I was like, oh, okay. So I go to the back of the line. The lady tell me, excuse me, sir. I goes, yes. Oh, I thought I was going to get scoldings. I still go, uncle, you can go inside too. I look at her, uncle, I'm younger than you. <laughs> See, that, that kind of stuff we, can be very offensive. But praise God that Jesus wasn't offended by what the people were saying. Yes. Amen? Amen? Okay, moving on to verse number 15. <laughs> Pastor Zena. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Okay. So in, in the English, the English word you isn't translated very well when we go to the Greek. 
And if we look at it, I'm reading for the New American Standard Bible. He says right here, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now when Jesus is saying this, he's kind of like coming from, uh, like from the south or, or Texas. He's not saying, who do you say that I am? He's saying, who do y'all say that I am? Yeah. He's talking to all of them, not just Peter. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So the question was posed to all of the disciples and not just Peter. A lot of people like to focus on just Peter, but the focus is not Peter. The focus is Christ. You know when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel is not about us. The gospel is for us. The gospel is about Jesus Christ and what he did. That God sent his son, broke through eternity, and came down to earth to die for our sins and to rise again from the grave three days later. For the days he was here reminding the disciples of the work that he came to do. Then the scripture says that Jesus ascended. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit descended. Amen. And when Jesus ascended, he went to the Father. Now he makes intercession for you and I. And one day, Jesus is coming back for us. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we can't forget this. But Jesus is not just talking to Peter, but he's talking to all of the disciples who are present at that time. Amen. So let's go to verse number 16. Moving on, Pastor Zeno. Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. So Simon Peter answers Jesus. Right? The question was, Who do you or who do y'all say that I am? So out of everybody who he was talking to, Peter answered the question. The thing is, with Peter, as we see his character within the Gospels, that guy, he talks a lot. He gets into a lot of trouble because he always opens his mouth. Amen? Maybe somebody should buy him for Christmas some peppermint socks. Or he always putting his foot in his mouth. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> but Peter says this. He makes this confession. In other words, on behalf of the disciples. And usually, like I said, Simon always gets us, or gets himself in trouble. Pastor Zila, can we go to verse number 17? And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Amen. 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 So Jesus says to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you about my Father in heaven. Jesus tells Simon that what he just said came only by divine inspiration. Only God could have told him something like that, even if Peter didn't know it at the time. And that's why Jesus calls Simon blessed. Say blessed. blessed. He's blessed because he confessed of who Jesus Christ is. Because of his heavenly insight of what God was showing him, he confessed that to Jesus. And by whom this heavenly insight came from, which was my Father, Jesus says. Yes. My Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. Yes. Isn't it great when God gives us revelation? Yes. Even when we're amongst the body, God can sometimes just talk to us. Yes. But there's a lot of times, just like how Jesus is doing, he's talking to everybody. But that's why we should be aware about what God is doing and be sensitive to His Holy Spirit yes. who's living and dwelling in us and speaking to us all the time. So He calls Him Simon, that you are blessed because my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. Yes. See, this also highlights our need for a supernatural revelation. Not, not anything supernatural or super spiritual which is off of what the Bible says of who Jesus is. But we need to know who Jesus is. And that comes through an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16. See, we know 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Amen? Amen. If any man be in Christ, he is a teacher. The old things have what? Past. Behold, all things have become new. See, we like to use that scripture and we point it to ourselves. 
But if we look at the context and the content of the scripture, this is also talking about the, the, the work of reconciliation that we as believers have with Jesus Christ. In other words, we're in the business with our Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit to reconcile the world to Him. So when he's talking about 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we like to point to ourselves. But actually, that scripture is for other people. In other words, how we view others. Amen. Pastor Gina, could you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16? So we have, so we have stopped e evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 is saying that when we see people, when we view people, we shouldn't view people through our human eyes. We need to view them through the heavenly perspective of how God sees people. Yes. That way it's easier for us to reach out to them where we can say, therefore, if any man be in Christ, no, but he's still doing jobs. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, well, she's still out there doing her things. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Amen. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We need to see them with a heavenly perspective. And the scripture is telling us here that we need to see Christ. We can't see him like how everybody else sees him. Just a prophet. <laughs> Just a good teacher. A man with great words. Oh, Jesus is such an inspiration. But he's more than that. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. And that's how, that's how we got to see Christ in that perspective and not through the human perspective. We cannot be like everybody else because we're not like everybody else. God has separated the church unto himself. We are his bride. We're waiting for him. We're expecting him to return. Hallelujah. So we need to see him. As God shows us. Thank you, Jesus. Flesh and blood. Yeah. Flesh and blood has revealed to us. Hey. If we look at things and look at people and look at situations, <coughs> the way that the world looks at situations, what makes us any different than the world? Yeah, that's right. The hope's supposed to be found in us, the scripture says. We have the hope. But if we're thinking, if we're acting, if we're making decisions just like the world, why the world got to come to the church? They can stay home and be like them. But they need to see a difference when they come into the house of God. They need to see the people of God functioning as the church is supposed to function. Can I get an amen? If we see Jesus like flesh and blood, then we're left with skeptical uh, theories of Jesus like how the Pharisees and the Sadducees did of his day. And they all remain in an adulterous and unbelieving and worshiping idols. This whole generation never change. So we cannot see Jesus in that perspective. Amen? Amen. Going on to verse 18. Almost all people we will make up in time for a garden barbecue. They, they close at nine. <laughs> Pastor Zina, could you read verse 18? And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against thee. Amen. We're going to break this down just quickly so we can look at this. So Jesus now calls Simon Peter. Petros. Now, a lot of us, we've been taught that, you know, he went from Simon as a pebble to Peter, the Petros, the, the rock, okay, or a stone. Now, the word Simon does not mean pebble. The word Simon actually means to hear, to listen, to hearken. <laughs> we get this even from the Old Testament. Simeon or Simone. That word is about hearing. The thing is, Peter is not a hearer. <laughs> Peter is a talker. Well, praise God for the scripture. Quick to hear, slow to speak. Maybe that scripture should have been made way before so Peter could have followed that. But anyway, Simon. He calls him, Jesus calls him Peter or Petros, which means 
stone, which means rock. Why? Well, since Simon declared that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, he now becomes the reputable leader for this group of disciples. Yes. Again, they're in the midst. Yes. Peter is there, the disciples are there, Jesus is there. It's not just Jesus and Peter alone like how we see in the movies. Yes. Amen. <laughs> This is Jesus talking to everybody, but now specifically, he's talking to Peter. He says, Peter, you are the stone. You see, because Simon declared who Jesus is. Now Jesus can declare who Simon is. The way we're going to get God to tell us who we are, what is our purpose, is we got to declare, we got to confess who he is first. Yes. So God can tell us who we intended to be. What is our purpose in life? And that's why sometimes, well, most times, even today, a lot of our young people are lost. They're just going along with the culture because it seems like the cultural wars are winning against the church. And it's because our young people, and there's a lot of people who just don't know who they are. And they feel lost. Yes. And they're just floating away and drifting away. Because they have not confessed who Jesus Christ is. Yes. The son of the living God. So our part is coming up soon, people. We're going to stay on track. I'm going to stay on track. So Jesus says to Simon Peter that you are Peter. You are Petros. And upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So Peter means stone. So what is this rock? What is this rock that Jesus was talking about? Now don't answer that. Please listen to this. Some say that Jesus is the rock. That Jesus is speaking of himself. In this context, right here, Jesus is not speaking of himself. When people say, well, what about when Jesus said, you know, you're building... Well, when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24... He talks at the ending of the Sermon on the Mount and he says, if anybody will hear or listen to these sayings of mine and does them, they are building upon a solid foundation. So when it comes to that in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is saying that he's not the rock. He's saying that his words is the rock. Everything that we're going to build our life on with God's word. That's what, it, that's what Jesus is saying, is that his word. I know I preached this at uh, One Love Ministries a couple of months ago. And people ask, well, if Jesus' words is the rock, is a solid rock, then what is the sand? The sand is everybody else's words. We cannot build our lives. We cannot build our ministry. We cannot build our relationships. We cannot build our churches on everybody else's words. That's the sand. We need to build on Jesus' words, on God's solid word. Solid foundation where we can stand, where we can start building on top of it. But it has to be built upon his word. But this rock is not the same as this rock. Because Jesus is talking about his church. So he calls Peter Petros, and this rock is in the Greek Petra. Okay? So how do I know that Jesus isn't talking about himself when it says, and upon this rock? Well, we know that because Jesus already confirmed in verse number 13 that he is the Son of Man. Yes. Right? He said, he, he told them, who do the people say that the Son of Man am or is? He declared him the Son of Man. In verse 16, Peter says this, he is the Christ, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? So he's the Son of Man and the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the Greek word for rock is Petra, say Petra. So we got Petros, Peter, and Petra, the rock. It's two different things. So what is Petra? Petra is a collection of stones. Yes. It's not just one stone. Peter is a stone. But he's only one of the other disciples. Amen. So that's what this is saying. This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, Peter, you are the rock. And upon this, rest of the stones, I will build my church. All the other disciples who were listening, who were there at this time, Jesus was saying that this ministry that I'm about to build, 
It's not going to be built on one man. It ain't going to just be built upon Peter. It's going to be built on a foundation of stones. Yes. Different people. And so when it says Petros, this Petros is talking about a rock or um, Peter is a rock. When we talk about Petra, it's talking about all of us. All of us who believe in his word. And this word, Petra, is talking about a rock that is chipped away, that is carved. Why? Because it needs to be placed a certain way. To make and to form a bigger slab, a bigger wall. Remember in verse number 15, the word you was plural, right? Yes. Talking about you all. So verse 18 isn't just a private conversation or a private discussion with Jesus and Peter. No. So what Jesus is saying here that Peter, you are the stone. You are the senior pastor. You are the leader. You are the preacher. You are the spokesman. But what I'm doing isn't going to only be based on just you. No ministry should just be based on one man or one woman. We only have one king, and that's Jesus. So everything we do should be based upon Jesus' words. But what Jesus is doing is he's bringing a collection of people to put us all together to build his church. You guys got it? This is what, this is what the word means. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Pastor Zina, could you read that for us? 1 Peter 2, verse 4 and 5. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. Wait, what was that again? As living stones as are being built up a spiritual house. Amen. Continue to read. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. So go back and read this chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, when Jesus talks about the rock, Petra, right here, he's not talking about himself. And he's not even talking about Peter. Jesus is saying that he's going to build something with a compilation of different individuals, different stones, who he has been shaped and, and fitted together to become something no one stone could ever hope to be on its own. And that's why Jesus links Petros, Peter, and Petra, the rest of the disciples, to himself. The church of God that Jesus is building is his people. And he wants to bring us all together to be the church of God. The church is a we thing and not a me thing. Amen. And this is what Jesus was trying to establish with them. Pastor Gina, uh, verse number 18. Again. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Say this with me. I will build my church. Jesus is going to build it. We don't build it. He builds it. And sometimes we worry, hey, how come my church not growing? How come my ministry not growing? You know why? God is still shaping you. God is still shaping you. So when the people do come, you ready. I know a lot of people don't like hearing that. But sometimes, yeah, we still need to be shaped. We're not perfect. There's, there's some things that God still... Yeah, we, he got to chip away. And you know those chipping away in, in Hebrews chapter 12? It talks about discipline. And we need to be disciplined sometimes, people. And what God does with the discipline, it shows that we are his sons and that we are his daughters. Because if we get disciplined by God, that means that he's our father. Meaning, he will take care of us. And we need to be put in uncomfortable positions so we know how to count upon the Holy Spirit and be dependent upon Him and not be independent based on what we know and what we say and what we do. We all always want to be dependent upon the Lord because Jesus is the one who's building His church. It's not us. So don't be discouraged when things aren't going your way. Don't look at things like flesh and blood. Come on, somebody. We cannot see things like flesh and blood. We have to take it through a heavenly perspective. He says that he is going to build his church. Here Jesus introduces us to the theology of the church. It's the first time in the Greek that we have this word ekklesia. Say ekklesia. 
I'm sure a lot of you heard this teaching before. The ecclesia is a church. It's mentioned in the New Testament many times. Here we apply the hermeneutical principle of the law of first mention. Amen. Pastor Harold uh, also talks about this a lot. This means if we want to understand the true meaning of a biblical text or a concept of a word, we've got to look at where it was used first. Well, the word church was used here first. And so every other word, when we see church, has to be compared to this word, the ecclesia. The second interesting fact is whoever, uh, who mentioned this? Who mentioned the church? Jesus. Say it again. Who mentioned the church? Jesus. It's Jesus who mentions the church because he is the one who's going to build it. Jesus established it. So no man, no organization, no government can tell you how to build your church. It's Jesus who established it. You want to know how to build your church in a certain way? Go ask him. Go ask Jesus because he builds the church. Amen. So we have the author of the church, Jesus, using the language of the church, Ecclesia, establishing the reason for the church here on earth, which we're going to get to next. So what is the Ecclesia and how is Jesus going to build his church? And the reason why we got to know this is because we got to know what is God's part and what is our part. And sometimes we like jump over to God's part as if we need our help. He doesn't need our help. We need help. <laughs> so it's good that we stay on our side so God knows that we're struggling. I need encouragement. I need fellowship, Lord. I try to build your church so I don't listen to you, but I don't stand on my side. We have to let him do his part. See, Jesus establishes his church through his disciples. And that's why we're called to make disciples. Go out into the all the, to all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Jesus said, I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. See, when we build his church, he doesn't leave us alone. He's always walking with us through it all. Again, we got to know what is our part and what is his part. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jesus establishes his church through his disciples. Pastor Zena, could you read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22? Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy te temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. In whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So this is telling us here that Jesus isn't the rock. Jesus is the cornerstone. Isn't that what it says here? Yeah. Do you know what the cornerstone is? It's an L-shaped stone and every other stone that follows follows this stone. So if Jesus is the cornerstone, we are the living stones and then we are fitted next to Jesus. We get aligned with Jesus. We get aligned with his word. We align with his will. We align with his way. And when we align, now the church starting to build. Yes. In the spiritual people. Yes. And so we have to understand that Jesus, when Jesus is the cornerstone, he set the pace for us. He said, I got to leave this place. But greater work shall ye do. Not that we're going to be greater than Jesus. Is What he's saying is that we're going to continue the work that he started. So when Jesus is the head cornerstone, all we gotta do is we gotta got make sure that we in line with what he's doing and not him come along with what we're doing. And as you know, no work, right? <laughs> when we do things, then we tell God our plans. This is what I'm doing. Can you bless it, please? Thank you, amen. It don't work that way. The disciples built their faith on Jesus' words. And Jesus used them to build his church. And Jesus wants to use us to build his church. It is his. It belongs to him. Pastor Zina, verse 18. And 
I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus uses the words gates of hell. Remember I talked about Caesarea Philippi? There's a big rock face, and there's all these temples that, that's built up against this rock. There's this one place, there's a big indention in this rock, and if you look on the bottom, there, there's a place where there used to be a pool, but that actually used to be a whirlpool. And what used to be in this great indention of the rock was a temple. And that temple, they used to make sacrifices. They used to sacrifice babies and throw the babies into this whirlpool. And this whirlpool would end up going underneath the rocks, killing the child, and then it would flow out to the river, which we can still see today. And as it flows out to the river, the river feeds all of the crops. So this is how they look at it, the pagans. If I take my child and give it to that priest of the gates of hell and get a blessing from a false god, my child is going to be sacrificed so my crops can grow. Isn't that sickening? Isn't that Sydney? Yeah, yeah. Well, guess what? They're still doing that today. Yeah. That's true. Aborting babies. Yeah. I tell you what, that, that's going to help you. That's going to help prosper you. Now, I'm not, not here to talk about all that stuff. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a professional. I'm not part of CDC. But what I'm going to talk about is the killing of our babies. Yeah. Yeah. You can't do that. That's against God's word. Yeah. We don't want that. That's murder. Yeah. But this is what they were doing. And that's why this place is called the gates of hell. So when Jesus was talking about the gates of hell, yes, he was talking about that place, the gates of hell, where they were sacrificing babies. But he was also talking about the spiritual gates of hell. See, the gates of a city in those times, Jesus' times, were the centerpiece of the strength of the city. So whenever you enter into a city, you know, they're not going to have uh, law Hala gates <laughs> or, or coconut frond gates, right? But you look at that, he said, but they don't want nothing in there that, that's worth stealing. There's nothing in there worth trading because there's no protection. So whenever you see the gates, and Jesus is talking about the gates of hell, this is some very strong gates. Amen? Amen. And then we also have the word hell. In the Greek is Hades, which means death or the grave. So Jesus is saying that the gateway of death will not overcome his church. Death will not overcome right. his church. Yes. The gates of hell, death and the grave will not overcome his church. But how, so, so, so what does that mean? We're going to get to it soon. But how do we know that this is his church? How do we know that the church is, that, that we run or that we oversee is his church? Is it because Jesus says so? Is it because other people say so? Or is it because we got the word church? In the name of our church? How do we know that we are His church? The way that we will know that we are His church is that hell is not prevailing against it. Amen. Death is not prevailing against our churches. Yes. And now when I talk about death, there's a lot of things. You know, the scripture says in John chapter 10, verse 10, uh, For the thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give you life. And life more abundantly. Yes. There's a lot of death that's going on in the church. Yes. We get discouraged. Our, our ministries are dying. Do you know that over 4,000 churches. And it increased during uh, 2020. There are 4,000 Christian Bible believing evangelical churches. That closes every year. Yeah. Isn't that sad? Yes. You know why? Because the gates of hell is prevailing. That's so sad. And a lot of times when we see these churches fade away, and I'm not saying us, but I'm saying us because we are part of the body of Christ. We are responsible for each other. Yes. But when they fade, they just fade. We don't see people trying to help them and, 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 and support them and love on them. We need that. We need that. Death shouldn't be winning against the church. 
Decay shouldn't be winning against the church. If health prevailing, that means we're not being shaped. We're not being fitted. And we're not working together. If health prevailing, then that means that we're building our own churches, yet we're using His name. You see, the church of today has become a loose gathering of independent stones who show up at the same location every week. They're very interesting, they're very inviting, they're very inspiring, yet they have no authority to help the church grow and to keep it from dying. Moving on, verse 19, and I'm closing. For real. One, one. It's my first one. I, I get 20 minutes. Huh? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loose in heaven. Now, I'm using the New American Standard Bible, which is, to me, a little bit closer to the original Greek context. And we're going to see here in verse 19, I will give you, Jesus says, the keys of the kingdom. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Jesus says, that he's giving Peter and the disciples, not just Peter, and the disciples, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the keys to the spiritual realm. Yes. So what are the keys? Well, all of us have keys, right? And what does the keys do? Our keys open and closes. Though it opens and closes, if I have the key, I have the authority. I have the authority to mind things. Yes. I remember as a young man, I used to work for Queen Ilokalani Children's Center. And uh, you know when you're young, yeah, you come over here. In other words, I used to hide a lot in the bushes. So I work. But as I was hiding, whenever I would hear the clanging of my boss's keys, that lets me know who has the authority. <laughs> See, he had all his keys. So every place he walked, you could hear the keys. And that let me know that he has the power. He has the authority to go into any room, to open it, and to close it. He also has the power to fire me. <laughs> Why? Because he get the keys. Well, Jesus is saying, I've given you guys keys. I'm giving you guys something to combat the gates of hell, to combat death, to combat decay. He's giving us these keys in a spiritual realm. So this is what I see and this is what I, from this and what the Lord gave to me. The keys that's given to the church is the teaching and the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the key. A lot of people say, well, I thought it was going to be a little bit more super spiritual. <laughs> well, it really ain't. How can you get more spiritual than the Word of God? Amen. See, the thing is, we like to hear stuff that makes us feel good, but though it makes you feel good, it ain't good for you. How do I know? <laughs> Try give me some boba tea, some mocha boba tea. But feel good for a little while. After 20 minutes, I'm going to be like this. <laughs> some things that make us feel good is really not good for us. Amen? Amen? But it's the preaching and the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus says that his church is given access to the spiritual realm and that his disciples would be the leaders of this new institution. Pastor Zina, verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loose in heaven. Oh, a lot of people like this. They love this scripture. They love to do these things with no biblical doctrine attached to it. They like to do whatever they like. They want to sound super spiritual, but everything that we do should be connected to the Word of God. Everything should be Bible-based. Now, when it says this, in the New American Standard Bible, it says, whatever you bind right now, bind, current, present, whatever you bind on earth, shall have been bound in heaven. Meaning, what is forbidden yeah. on earth has already been forbidden in heaven. Yeah. Meaning, God said no. no. Yeah. That's it. End of story. But it says that whatever you loose on earth right now shall have been 
Loose in heaven. In, in other words, what God allows, yes. that's what we can do on earth. Yes. Yeah, if no can, no can. Yeah. If can, yeah. can. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. yeah. But everything is based off of what God already did. You cannot pray stuff. We cannot pray stuff if God didn't say it. Yes. You know, sometimes it's hard for me for, you know, people tell me, oh, you know, Pastor, I'm not good, doing good financially. Can you pray for me? Yeah, I can pray for you, but are you tithing? Are you giving? I cannot do nothing beyond what they never do first. Yes. I can have faith for them, to pray for them, to help them. Lord, help them obey your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jesus. But they let me pray spiritual blessing upon them. They let me pray for it. I cannot do what heaven said no can. I only can do what heaven said I can do. Yes. It's not in my hands. If you read it in, in, in a different version, it's almost like saying that we in control of God. Uh. Whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Whatever we forbid on earth shall be forbidden in heaven. It sounds like we get, get control, but guess what? We don't. And that's why I love this version. That we have to look at it in that way that God allowed. Whatever he allowed, that's what we can allow. Whatever he forbid, that's what we forbid. Amen. People say, oh, Bishop. Oh, I met this new boy, Bishop. He's so handsome. <laughs> oh, I love him so much. So, oh, good. You know, the scripture does say um, it's not good that you be alone. You know, but I was thinking of moving in with him. Okay? So, the good part is God don't like you be alone. Amen? God loves that. God likes relationship. But what God forbids is fornication. Come on, somebody. That's how, that's how the binding and loosing is talking about. Oh, you know, Bishop. I know the Lord let me prosper, so I will make a business. Praise God. God wants you to prosper. God let you be wise. Yeah. But I went into business with this guy. He not saved. He don't love Jesus. But you know what? He get the money. <laughs> God let us prosper. Amen? Amen? God allows that. But the scripture also says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Yes, yes. He wants us to shut that door. Why? Because if I'm a businessman and I'm a Christian and he not, when I like tithe from the business to my church, he will tell me no. That's right. Why? We get different beliefs and values. When I like shut down the business on Sunday, he will tell me no. That's right. So we have to know what God said, what he allows and what he forbids. Can I get an amen? Yeah. But all of that comes from the word of God. We don't make up stuff to say. We don't make up stuff to do. We got to go off based off the word of God. Yes. The key, the gospel yes. of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm closing for you this time. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't we like to see heaven, yeah, overrule hell? See all this death going on, destruction going on. Wouldn't we like to see it? Thank you for listening to the Spirit. Wouldn't we like to see that? You see, until God's people decide to be kingdom people, then the church will never realize the authority that has been given. You see, we're not just simply to go to church or to grow our church. We are to be the church. We are the legislative authority and the expression of God here on earth. Amen. Pastor Zina, could you read for me Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1? So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. One more time for us, please. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. So the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You know what this is saying? That our job as a church, because we have the key, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we have the authority to allow and to forbid 
because God has given us the keys. Jesus has given us the keys. This is saying in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 that God checks in with the church first before he allows the angels to act on it. That's what he's saying. And sometimes we wonder why, why things not happening. God waiting for us. He's waiting for the church to be the church. He's waiting for the church to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. This is so important. If we look at this, the, the content of what we're talking about. Jesus is talking about building his church. And then he talks about uh, Peter being the stones. Then he talks about Petra, the disciples. And he's going to use them to build the church. Then he talks about the keys. And then he talks about uh, allowing and forbidding. But what we miss too is that Jesus is also talking about life and death. He's talking about life and death. If you read the content, the, the next one right after this, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to 23, Jesus is predicting his death and his resurrection. And this one, he's talking to Peter. And Jesus is telling Peter, we're going to go back to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. And what does Peter do? Peter rebukes Jesus. Not so, Lord. Not so. Again, Peter looking through flesh and blood. Jesus rebukes him. Then in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 to 28, what does Jesus say? He says, he tells him, take up your cross and follow me. What does the cross represent? Death. This whole thing, what we're doing as the church, it's about life and death. It's all about life and death. We only get one shot. We got one shot in life. Sorry, if you're thinking about reincarnation, you're in the wrong religion. <laughs> the scripture says, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We will be before our Lord. This is about life and death, people. People out there are dying. But the church, the scripture says that we are the living stones. We are the living stones. We, we need to build the household of God. Are we, am I talking about our ministries? Am I talking about our churches? Yes. But I'm also talking about us as God's people. We need to be the living stones. This is about life and death. How do we know? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Should not perish. Death. But have everlasting life. Life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. But through him you might be saved. Life and death. John 3, 18 also says, if you believe in him, if you believe in him, you are not condemned. But if you do not believe, you are condemned already because you have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We're talking about life and death here, people. The scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life to Jesus Christ. The gospel is life and death. That's the keys. And what God wants us to do to take it out. To the world. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. People need to hear us. People need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 For the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness, but he is long suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. That all should come to repentance. Yes. We need to be the church. We need to yes. prevail against the gates of hell. We got the keys, people. Go the key is to open up the kingdom of heaven. Let's use the key, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to lock the gates of hell. Yes. That's what we need to do. Use the gospel to shut these gates once and for all. People are lost and dying. Glory. 
just want to do a, a, a short altar call. And again, this is this is more about the shaping tonight. Not here to make anybody feel bad, but at the same time, if, if you need it. We, we just want to pray. Can I call up the, the senior pastors to, to come up, please, if, if you don't mind? Uh, I would like to call you up if you can help me pray. We don't want to be here for too long. But there's some of us who need uh, shaping. There's some things that needs to that we need to that needs to be chipped away. And we know how it is when, when things are just a little off. We feel like things are just a little off. And I'm not saying that you're not saved. I'm not saying that you're losing your salvation. But what I'm saying is that the things that need to be chipped away is hindering your relationship with Jesus. Nothing to be ashamed about. But God wants to shape us. And when we allow Him to shape us, guess what? He does a way better job than any clinic could. He does a way better job than any psychiatrist or any doctor let God do the work. So I'm going to call you right now. If, if, if you need to come, if you need some prayer, we got some pastors up here for you. Can you come now, please? Anybody, as the music continues to pray, let, let the Holy Spirit just move in this place.